Hi, everyone. Welcome to Call to Action. This is a conversation series where we speak to positive change makers in our society to give us insights, experiences, and perspectives on key issues in the education sector. My name is Henry, and I'm with Action Tutoring. I handle media, PR, and policy. And I'm excited because I'm speaking today to Hannah Wilson of Diverse Educators. I was part of a workshop that Hannah facilitated and it was just fascinating. Hannah is a leadership consultant, a coach and trainer. She's a co-founder of Women Ed and also Diverse Educators, very passionate about diversity, equity and inclusion and also belonging, has been training and mentoring so many people as well. Hannah? Thank you so much for joining us on it's Call to Action. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. And it's nice as a follow-up, isn't it? Because we obviously had that training session a few weeks ago. So when I got your email, it's nice to have a, a conversation that builds on the conversation as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's Black History Month. This is the month to celebrate the contributions of Black people in the UK's history. And just as we know, we are in education. It's good that we focus on education. So I think I'm going to start from there. But today's topic is improving the outcomes of young black people in education but before we delve into that black history month do you think the uk's education or the curriculum has really covered and is teaching black history well enough today it's, it's a really good question isn't it i think i think there's a lot of schools trying to do better but a lot of schools are trying to plug big gaps that have been there for a long time. And it's and the fact that you've specified UK history, that comes up a lot, doesn't it? About the fact that October being all about celebrating blackness, but often black Americanness. Um, and, and we look at all the civil rights movement and we celebrate all these very famous black figures. And I think a lot of schools miss the mark by not actually thinking about UK black identities. Um, so I know that comes up a lot as a criticism. Then there's obviously the criticism of whether we should even be doing Black History Month because Black people are Black 365 days a year. So why do we isolate it in the one month? That's an interesting intention because with schools trying to now cover all of the different identities, they would justify that where it's a, it's a month more than perhaps they were doing. But we want to move to the, in the, in the future, we want to move to the point where Black culture, Black identity is embedded and integrated throughout the curriculum. We don't necessarily need a month to spotlight it, but for a lot of schools, it's going to take them time to get there. And I think the other thing that comes up for me a lot around October and the celebration of Black identity is that it's often a lot of Black men being spoken about and not Black women or Black queer people or Black disabled people. And, and thinking about that intersectionality and looking at the the complexity and the hybridity of those different parts of our identity that often gets overlooked as well. So like one of my passions, lip, I'm an English teacher by trade, was I read a lot of the black um, female writers. That was the kind of my genre that I specialized in for my degree. So I think we need to expand what we look at sometimes and what we curate and what we think about when it comes to um, the celebration of Black History Month to, to be more specific and not just to perhaps do a, a broad brushstroke umbrella approach. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, be more specific, also celebrate the intersectionality um, of identities uh, during Black History Month. I think that's a good one. Now to our main conversation, ensuring better outcomes for young Black people in education. And I want to quote something from a 2020 briefing paper from the House of Commons. And it says, young people from Black ethnic groups are more likely to go on to higher education than average but less likely to obtain high grades, enter prestigious universities, or end up in a highly skilled job, steady feather, or have a career satisfaction. And just in the same 2020 briefing paper, it says that in 2018, 2019, this is before the pandemic, black ethnic, you know, black ethnic people in schools, 59% uh, of them attained the standard pass in English and Maths GCSE which was the lowest rate for any major ethnic group. What do you think is, you know, to blame for this performance trajectory, Anna? Mm. It's a really interesting tension that you're, you're kind of like spotlighting there. Because um, with the families who I've worked with, I've, I've spent a lot of my career working in South London with big black communities, lots of black, lots of black students, their families were very aspirant for their young people and they wanted them to be qualified and skilled and to go on to university. And I think perhaps the bit that's missing there as well from the trajectory piece is then not only the performance gap, but also the pay gap. 
that not, not only are they not getting onto the right courses, the right universities, but then when they do go into their professional career, the the deficit around the salary gap, it, it can be really quite significant as well. So I think it goes back to careers education. I think one of the missing pieces of um, schools, diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racist approaches in particular is that it's often a strategy that's done in isolation to other strategies and policies. So thinking about the correlation, the overlap between the anti-racist approach, the DEI approach, and mental health and well-being is often a disconnect. And then thinking about the correlation between DEIB, anti-racism, and the careers education strategy is often another disconnect. And what I mean by that is that I don't think all schools are carefully curating the visible role models that they are presenting to um to show what can be. That whole um adage about if you can't see it, you can't be it. And 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 the awareness around the navigation into those different career pathways. Um, I think that is saying that schools could do better. That like when I was a head teacher, perhaps it was controversial, but when we had our careers assemblies and we were inviting in different um edu- different sorry, different um professionals from science, technology, engineering, and maths, that was our specialism in school, I would say to organizations, like please don't send me a, a white man. My white boys know they can be scientists and technologists. I, I want you to send me someone who debunks and challenges the, the gender and racial stereotype of who can be what. So I think sometimes there's a bridge there to be built um, around the the pathways we are presenting as opportunities um, on the horizon for our young people as well. I know the other thing that comes up a lot and, and is around representation within the workforce. And when we look at the data around the lack of male, rep- so the lack of black representation when it comes to teachers and leaders and governors, but then at higher education, it's even greater, isn't it? It was signif- significantly underrepresented when it comes to lecturers, professors, vice chancellors, or higher ed- education institutions. I think that's a thing to, to look at as well around, around representation at all of those different tiers of the hierarchy. That's an interesting observation uh, to make. And I know you mentioned some other things beyond learning, but I think that's what I'm coming to do. Beyond studies, are there other are invisible barriers or sticky flaws that is to blame for this performance? Well, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, about who gets what opportunities, who who gets what additional support or, or intervention, who seem to have the potential um, to do particular things. Um, I think that data isn't always analysed or interrogated through that intersectional lens. I can remember doing certain years and years ago um, where we were due an offset inspection and I was responsible for extracurricular and enrichment. And I did a massive data analysis piece across our 1,500 pupils in our 11 to 18 school about who had been advised on what school trips and who was accessing which clubs. And it was a very interesting narrative around the data, the picture it painted, about if you were white and you were gifted and talented, you got invited on 10 more trips than if you were not gifted and talented or if you you weren't white or if you weren't male. So I think looking at those trends and those data pieces around who gets the opportunities and and we could have that conversation about pupils, but also the teachers, the leaders, like who gets the opportunity to be mentored, to be coached, to, to do different leadership pathways. For me, it's that conscious investment, isn't it? And I know that One of the things for us to really think about is the idea of sponsorship, where we are sponsoring individuals and groups to get access to opportunities they wouldn't normally get access to. So thinking about that conscious investment in mentoring, coaching, sponsorship, advocacy for changing some of those patterns, disrupting some of those narratives. Like we the data's there, it's stark. It's stark about the the trajectories. What are we doing differently to dismantle it and, and to kind of crack it? And one of the terms that we always introduce when we're running training around recruitment, talent management, leadership, is the concept of the, the concrete ceiling. The, you talked about sticky floors, but most people are familiar with the metaphor of the glass ceiling, um, which sits above women, particularly in education. But not everyone's as familiar with the concept or the terminology of the concrete ceiling. And in fact, the new term for people listening, a glass ceiling you can see through. So women can see whether men are getting access to things. 
but but glass you can shatter it, it between you, you can see where you want to be you can see where you want to break it whereas the concept of the the metaphor around the concrete ceiling is that it's reinforced it's opaque you can't even see what's on the other side and it's much it's a much harder metaphor to um so much harder barrier um to dismantle and disrupt so i think that's i think that's a concept that perhaps more white leaders white governors white trustees need to get their head around to understand the difference between the two because quite often people just think it's the same barrier for different people and it's not and also that barrier can be systemic structural societal but it's at different points in different people's careers so thinking about educators in particular the the concrete ceiling sits above middle leaders and 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 people of color not getting access to leadership opportunities senior leadership opportunities so they vote with their feet and they leave teaching so i think looking at that kind of what stories are the data is the data telling us around different career pathways different trajectories the, the data you just talked about there is is interesting reading but what do we then do with that insight that's the bigger question many really, isn't it yeah that is the bigger question and that job of using the insight to introduce policies that actually you know changes it and concrete ceiling, I've never come across that. So that's a, a new learning. I think I'm going to there read you go. more here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Following up on that is the fact that research has shown that disadvantage really starts at the very early years of our lives. Children from low-income backgrounds are known to start school four and a half months behind their affluent peers. But what can be done specifically at the early years to help dismantle the whole disadvantage cycle and get disadvantaged young people at that early age to actually make progress and catch up. Mm. Are we thinking specifically about disadvantaged um, black and brown children at this, like we're talking about that intersect? So yeah. I, mean, like, I think it's interesting looking at um, what's happening around diversity, inclusion and anti-racism in particular, that when you look at the early years agenda provision, it's often quite a white space and there's some amazing practitioners doing brilliant work when it comes to anti-racism in the early years. Um, Liz Pemberton, um, she calls herself the Black Nursery Manager. She's actually on mat leave at the moment. But she and others like um, Laura Lane, whose work is amazing, um, they've got a, um, a Black early years list of educators. So even thinking about like who are thought leaders within that provision, within that key stage, is often quite white. And going back to your question a minute ago about the policy piece, I think what often goes wrong, and I use we we use this um this this term or this lens quite a lot around like intention versus impact. That a lot of the people writing those policies, writing those strategies, writing those action plans are, are white people trying to rectify the problems experienced by black people. But actually, are we consulting the white people, and are the white people contributing to writing the policy, ratifying the policy? that's often the disconnect at a systemic level when it comes to policy making. So then thinking about early years as a kind of a, another layer to that, but who is who is designing the policy for early years? Who's designing the curriculum for early years? Who's curating um, the reading spine for early years? Are we being intentional about representation in the early years? That That is the, the bit that we need to be looking at, that can we establish that foundation? Um, as young as our children join the education system, what can we do differently from the get go um, to think about identity representation? So it's a given, um, as opposed to a kind of a, a bolt on or an add on later. Yeah, I totally agree. And I want us to move ahead to primary and secondary levels. I know you've spoken a bit about that, but do you think there's specific policies that can help dismantle inequalities at these levels? I know tutoring is one of the ways to bridge that gap, ensuring that underperforming pupils who cannot afford tutoring get the additional assistance and support. Mm -hmm. But aside tutoring, are there other things that can help at the primary it, well I mean, it has to start with the curriculum surely the 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 tutoring mentoring all of those um interventions mediation support mechanisms are so powerful we know they make a massive difference but what are we actually doing to um challenge the root cause that like if what are we doing differently and how we do things and i think that i think we have to stop stop and pause sometimes if we keep doing the same we're going to keep getting the same and we're often throwing money at the problem and putting plasters on the problems and not actually fixing the problems or, or doing things differently. So for me, 
there's a lot of work to be done at a strategic level about are there things that we could and should be doing differently that we've just done the same for so long because it's perhaps easier that's what we know um so thinking about um how we structure the school day for example um who's doing the teaching what are we teaching how are we teaching there's so many layers to unpick there about cultural a culturally relevant pedagogy a culturally competent um pedagogy um thinking about that cultural consciousness when it comes to who and what we're teaching i think that's the gap but because the school system is so stretched and and stretched so thin and so busy it's so packed that we're often just putting plants on the problems and when i think about my like i spent most of my career in secondary and we always talked about, we've never quite broke that cycle about the year 10, year 11, that we were always doing an intervention in the year 11, whereas actually we should have been doing an intervention with year eight and year nine to stop the problems coming, like manifesting in year 11. But you never have the space to like plan forward to catch up because you're, we're in this cyclical process. So I think really we need a big disruption and a big kind of like conscious commitment to change but it needs to be collective and that's the problem piece isn't it because how do we hit pause and how do we create space for um multiple phases and multiple institutions to be doing things differently simultaneously that that's that's the the, the, the big issue of it all really isn't it Exactly. And you mentioned collective action. That brings me to my next question around parents and guardians. Uh, change also starts from the home. Um, you know, young people spend most of their early years at home as well. So what can parents and guardians do to help contribute to change of this particular you know, system or performance? See, so I think like what is it that schools can do differently with how they work with parents and carers is perhaps what we need to to pay attention to because I think schools often tell the parents and carers what they need to do and it's quite a like the power dynamics often quite imbalanced about the relationship between the kind of the school the leaders the governors and the parents and the carers and and how we create more equity in that relationship and more democracy in that relationship and how we create space to listen to the voices and the views of the parents and the carers that might be quite different to the voices and the views of the schools. I think that how I would just ran some training earlier on today with um, a school over in, in Brazil. And, it, and it's fascinating really, because like wherever you are in the world, it's a similar kind of conversation, it's similar kind of problems, it just manifests itself in slightly different ways. And they were talking about the kind of the tensions in Sao Paulo between different identity groups and then the advantage gap, the disadvantage gap. And, and we think that Brazil is a completely different country to the UK, but, but it's, it's, it's not that dissimilar, really, with a lot of the things we need to be thinking about. So I think thinking about how we work with parents and create true partnership and, and, and collaboration, that to me... Um, is what where some schools perhaps need to revisit their their kind of their their plans, I guess, or their commitment, or the or the ways they work with those different stakeholders. Engaging parents more closely definitely is a way of helping them, involving them, so they are part of that change cycle. Right. And uh, yeah, it's still Black History Month. Uh, we're talking ensuring better outcomes for young black people and on this show Hannah there's a last question that we always ask because the show is call to action we put the question to you what is your call to action to everyone watching this as we celebrate black history month what can they do to contribute to better outcomes for young black people in their own ways but for me, the call to action always needs to be about the the allyship that more white people need to activate, particularly white people who are living in or working in what we call like white majority spaces, that this work is as important in like Dorset, Norfolk, Devon, the kind of the wider areas of the UK as it is in South London. Um, and I think the work um, manifests itself in different ways in those spaces. But I think that um, TED talk about the kind of the Dr. Redeen Bishop, Sims Bishops talks about um, literature being this metaphor around like creating mirrors, windows and sliding doors with, with, within the reading for young people. And I think that's a metaphor to really hold on to for the curriculum. And I think for people listening who identify as being white, 
that reflection on and that awareness on of sorry your own experience with schooling and your own experience with curriculum and your identity constantly being affirmed and validated because a white person saw themselves in the classroom in the teachers in the leaders in the governors in the library in the curriculum that's often taken for granted that constant validation and affirmation um and reinforcement i guess of your sense of self and your sense of identity and, and i think for us to step back and, and be able to decenter ourselves be, to be able to see those gaps and to appreciate how that affirmed us but how that could actually um, really erode someone's sense of self when they don't see themselves in all of those different spaces that can then be a conscious intention that educators make about what they teach who they teach how they teach it to really think about representation and the positive impact it has for for our young people and being very mindful that we don't then just perpetuate certain um, stereotypes about where you can be successful when you're black. And I always use the example of walking around secondary schools and when you get to the music department and when you get to the PE department, you see all the black musicians and you see all the black athletes. So that equates to subconsciously, if you're black, you can be a musician or you can be a sports person. When you go up to the physics lab, do you see black role models up there or the computing lab? So we need to make sure that we're not doing pockets of representation and pockets of validation. And we're thinking across the curriculum. Because I think going back to my point about the careers education of visible role models, that can often create um, a, a barrier that we don't perhaps see. Strong last words there from Hannah Wilson of Diverse Educators. I think what I got out of that final uh, response is allyship and representation. They do matter. They should always be diverse, to be intersectional. And um, as an ally, anyone can be one. How do you support Black people to achieve it when you see any form of inequality? Speak up against it, show support when it's needed the most. Thank you so much, Hannah Wilson of Diverse Educators for joining us here on Call to Action. To you watching, you can volunteer for Action Tutoring to help young disadvantaged pupils who cannot afford tutoring to get access to the additional support. So log on to www.actiontutoring.com.org.uk slash volunteer. So go to the Action Tutoring website and you can volunteer. Thanks so much, Hannah, once again. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye, everyone.